We'll watch it later. I don't know. All right, we're on to chapter 12 in the book here. Any, uh, before I say anything, any thoughts or comments or ideas or questions or anything like that from chapter 12? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Keep him away uh, from self-awareness and, and self-knowledge. The way I thought about it is they're trying to keep him in the dark. All right, well, well, we'll talk more about that. Any other thoughts or comments or questions or ideas? I thought it was like keeping him asleep. Yeah, keeping him asleep is another good way of thinking of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they've got they've got the they've got the patient headed in the right direction here. They're happy about this, right? Mm -hmm. Screw tape and wormwood are. They're slowly the, another word that I think we could use to describe what's happening here. They've got him drifting, right? Slowly drifting, right? Mm -hmm. And screw tape is even goes to the point of being willing to say, yeah, it's just fine if he keeps going to church. And even if he keeps taking communion, yeah, yeah. like <laughs> fine, right? Now we'll we'll get it. We'll we'll talk about that in a little a little bit more in a in a while here. But but yeah, the the main idea of this chapter there's really just one thing in this whole chapter, and it's screw tape and wormwood talking about slowly leading people away, causing them to drift away from faith in Jesus in a way in, in, so, so that they don't even realize it's happening mm -hmm. until suddenly one day they find themselves way off far away and it seems like it's too late to do something about it right so i think what this chapter if we could summarize it right off the beginning here what it's teaching us is the devil isn't just trying to get us to you know, commit heinous crimes or sins or something like that, or totally in an instant renounce Christian faith. Not at all. He works in much more subtle ways than that, trying to gradually lead, lead God's people astray. Any other thoughts or questions, comments? Okay, well then let's, let, let's, uh, let's talk about a little bit more here. So, and this is another one of those times. I don't have as much stuff on th that I got ready. So maybe, maybe it won't take quite so long, but then I say that and then <laughs> it never <laughs> actually comes to fruition. So you never know. Uh, so it's, anyways, right at the beginning of chapter 12 here on page 57, screw tape says, obviously you are making excellent progress. They're happy with how things are going right now. My only fear is lest in attempting to hurry the patient, you awaken him to a sense of his real position. So basically he's saying, don't rush this, right? You've got him, you've got him angling off in the right direction. Remember these friends have become involved in his life and he's getting pulled into, into their circle of friends. Uh, and, and he says, good, you've got him headed in the right direction. Now don't, don't overdo it all at once because if he does, or if you do, he might realize what's happening. Keep him slowly drifting so he doesn't see it happening. So he keeps going. He says, he, the patient, must be made to imagine that all the choices which have affected this change, of course, are trivial and reversible. So keep him thinking that he, the, the patient probably realizes that his life has changed a little bit, right? He, these new friends are changing his life and, and and changing how he lives and what he does. He's realizing that, but he says, we've got to keep the patient thinking that these changes that are happening are trivial. I mean, like they're no big deal. They're not that important, right? Remember that's a couple of chapters ago, they, 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 screw tape was saying to him, to Wormwood, we want to make it so that, you know, he's doing one thing with his friends on Saturday night and then Sunday morning going to church, doing something that really contradicts it but don't let him see that there's a contradiction between what he's doing one day and what he's doing another day, right? And so that's the same thing here. Make him see that this is all trivial. It doesn't really matter. It's no big deal what's happening now, okay? But also reversible, that if he wanted to take it back at any point, he could, right? And, and everything would go back to how it was. So make him think that the changes that are happening uh, are both trivial and reversible. And then, oh yeah, there's one more here. Uh, and, and then we're going to skip right to the end of the chapter already, actually. 
he must not be allowed to suspect that he is now, however slowly, heading right away from the sun on a line which will carry him into the cold and dark of utmost space. Okay, I think here, we, this is a bit of a helpful picture, I think. So what I did is I actually put in a picture okay? um, of the solar system. Okay, because this is kind of the image that screw tape is using here. So we've got here, you know, all, all the planets orbiting around the sun. And this is, you know, it's even got, you know, far distant Pluto way out there in the top left corner, tiny little thing that they don't even call a planet anymore. When I was in school, that was a planet. Now it's not counted as a planet anymore. I don't know. Anyways, it's just me being, you know, bearing grudges from my childhood or something. I don't know. Um, but what screw tape says is, is, is imagine like this is like the, the solar system, all right? Those planets orbit around the sun, okay? And actually, you know, from what, th th this diagram isn't perfect because what we know about the orbits of planets around the sun is they're not perfect circles, right? They're more like, they're, they're ellipses, they're ovals, right? So sometimes they move farther and closer, right? So sometimes the earth is closer to the sun and sometimes it's farther depending on where we are in our orbit around the sun, right? That, that's just how it works. But it always stays within this orbit sometimes closer, sometimes farther, but always connected in you know, a relative kind of way to the sun. What screw tape says they've accomplished is they've gotten this man out of his orbit. Pretend that the sun is Jesus, which is easy to do, right? Especially in English, because you just have to change one letter, right? It turns from sun to sun and then you're good, right? So the sun is Jesus and the man as a Christian is orbiting around Jesus, which is what Christians should always be doing, orbiting around Jesus. Now, what, what screw tape says has happened is we've disrupted that orbit. So it's no longer the same oval around the sun all the time, but it's actually turned into a spiral that isn't gonna, it gets farther and isn't gonna start swinging back closer like the oval normally does, but it's just gonna keep getting farther slowly but surely spiraling away, right? And, and so slowly that it's like, you know, the, the, the I don't know, metaphor or analogy of the, of the, the, the putting a, like a, a, a frog in a pot of boiling water, right? But if you put it in the boiling water right away, then it's dead, right? But, you know, you put it in the water and it slowly boils. I don't even know if that's actually a true thing and I've never boiled any frogs, I don't know. <laughs> But right, the idea is that it slowly adjusts to the temperature of the water, right? And doesn't realize that something dangerous is happening. And that's what, what screw tape is suggesting here. Having him slowly start to spiral away from Jesus, the sun at the middle, slowly but surely, so he doesn't even realize it's happening, but progressively he's getting farther and farther away until someday he's way out there, well, far, far left side, but beyond Pluto, He's, already, he's left the solar system and he hasn't even realized it, right? Because it's been happening so slowly, incrementally been pulled away. Am I making sense with that? That's what screw tape wants to, that's what they want to accomplish here, right? That's what they're trying to do to the patient. And I think it's fair to say that that's what the devil is trying to do to every Christian, right? Slowly pull them out of the orbit, right? Get them drifting. Yeah, I, I, anyways, I could carry on with space analogies for a long time, but I'll leave that alone for now. So, so now, now we're going to skip to a little bit from right from the end of the chapter here, because like I said, the whole chapter is one, is one solid unit of the same kind of idea all the way throughout. And so on page 60, which is the last page of the chapter, I think, no, the second last, yeah, bottom of the page on page 60, he says, remember... The only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. The only thing that matters is the extent that you pull him away from Jesus, the son, right? Get him far away. Get him out past Pluto, right? It doesn't matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Right, which fits with that space analogy again, right? The sun is the light in the middle. Out beyond Pluto is nothing, right? Well, there's stuff out there, but for all intents and purposes, it's nothing, right? 
So he says, it doesn't matter if the sins are big or small, as long as the sins, when you add them all up together, are just slowly edging him away, one little step at a time, right? Because as you, as you get him out of that orbit, he just kind of goes farther and farther out, and it's going to get harder and harder to bring him back into the orbit, right? I was thinking about that yesterday when we talked about it at Redeemer, um, and, and the, well, the movie, but also the real-life story of Apollo 13, right? The spacecraft loses power, all this kind of stuff. And when you watch the movie, and I, I think this is true in real life too, a lot of what they do when they're moving those spacecraft around out there is they're using the gravity of the planets and of the moon. They, in the movie anyways, they, they like slingshot them around the moon to get them coming back to Earth, right? Because the, the problem happens while they're on their way to the moon and they somehow got to get this spacecraft turned around so it's headed back. So they, they use the moon to do that, but in order to stop them from just orbiting around the moon for the rest of their lives, which wasn't going to last very long at that point, they have to fire the rockets, right? They don't fire, the, the, the spaceship's not flying through space with its rockets blasting the whole time. They don't have enough fuel for that, right? They only blast the rockets just to, to get them on the right track again. And so what screw tape is suggesting here is that once you get them farther and farther and farther away, the only thing that's going to get them get him back on course is someone firing the rockets, right? And the person who's got to fire the rockets is Jesus. But if the man, the patient, never realizes how far off course he is, the rockets are never going to get fired. He's just going to keep spinning, spinning out there until he's lost in space somewhere, right? So they want to keep edging him away from the light, from the sun, from Jesus, who is the light of the world, right? And out into the nothingness. This is what they're trying to do. And this is probably the most famous, well, one of the most famous quotes in this entire book, okay? On page 61, it's the last line of the, of the chapter. So he goes away from the, the orbiting in space analogy and just may, talks about a road now. He says, this, indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. For screw tape and wormwood, the, the, the safest way to get someone to the ultimate destination they want to get them to, which is hell, is not to make them do crazy, awful things and send them spiraling into hell, but is slowly just to get them on to this gradual road that kind of is nice and easy and just works their way towards where screw tape and wormwood want them to be. Right, the gradual road, soft underfoot, it's nice and easy going that way. No sudden turns, no surprises, no milestones to realize they're on their way. They're just kind of blindly walking and there's no signposts or anything like that. A gradual road. That's what screw tape says. The safest way to get someone to help. Thoughts or questions about that? Like the what, sorry? Mm -hmm. So we talked about a couple of weeks ago uh, from Revelation chapter two, I think that one's in two or three, anyways, two. Uh, these, these seven letters that Jesus writes to these seven churches, and one of them is the church in Laodicea. And remember, he, that's where he calls them, you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. And he, Jesus even says, I wish you were cold. Even if you were just cold, like your faith had gone out completely, then I could warm you back up again. But as long as you're just lukewarm, you're no good to anybody, you're not loving anyone, right? And you think you're okay, so you're just kind of muddling along and you don't really think you need my help either, right? And Jesus says, I spit you out of my mouth, right? Like lukewarm food, right? Not that lukewarm food's actually that bad, but anyways, I ate my soup lukewarm yesterday because the microwave at Redeemer wasn't working great. But that's, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> But the point is, the point is, is that in a lot of ways that this just kind of being in the middle is actually worse than just having no faith at all, right? Being in the middle is a bad spot to be because, and that's what screw tape is saying here. This middle kind of thing is the safest way to get a person to hell because they think they're okay, but they're actually not because their, their faith is failing without them even realizing it. But we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. Any uh, thoughts or comments before we carry on? Do you know, most people 
Yeah. They don't they don't realize it's really happening. Yeah. And, and then they find their Sunday mornings are more pleasant. They're, they're yeah. Out. The road got easy, right? Yeah. Yes, and, and it just continues to slide. Yeah. But the hardest thing is how do we get to that? Yeah, that's right. Well, that, that's the thing. It's, that's the thing, right? Because th they've slowly orbited away, right? And actually, you don't. We can look at this on an individual basis and say, what do we, you know, what about an individual where that's happened? But we can also look at it, at, at how our our whole society has done this over the last seventy years. Our whole society has orbited away from Jesus, right? And it happened generation after generation. You just have to look at our church, our congregation on a Sunday morning. The majority of people here are from a particular generation, right? And the generation that comes after them, we have a couple of those people, right? And then the generation that comes after that, we have one or two of those. And then the generation after that is your pastor and about it, right? <laughs> That's, that's our whole society has done this, right? So, it, and, and it, it happened slowly, well, kind of slowly, 70 years in the history of the world is actually kind of fast, but, but, but it happened slowly enough that our society didn't see it happening and didn't really care. And now our society is out there past Pluto and is actually kind of liking it out there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, yeah. It's 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 not it's not unique to our country to be sure. It's all kinds of countries around the world, and 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 they've all drifted. But I think it's all. I think it. So it's it's important to recognize that our culture has done this, but it's also important to realize it's important to realize that this happens to other individuals and i think we can we can probably all think of people in our own our own lives family friends other people like that who have who have done the drifting done the wandering right um so it's important to realize that and to think well how do we get those people back and as soon as we ask that question we need to realize it's the wrong question to ask the right question to ask is how is jesus going to bring these people back right and Jesus, now, now that, that doesn't mean we're not going to have a part in it, right? How, we could say, how might Jesus use us to bring those people back, right? But like we said before, the only person, going back to the space analogy, the only person who can fire the rockets and get them back into orbit is Jesus. Now, if, there, if this individual sitting there covering the rocket, the button that does the rockets, saying, I won't let anybody touch it, well, Jesus isn't going to fight them. Right? You find you don't want to fire the rockets, you're going to be left out in space. But he's he, Jesus is trying to you know pull them back to himself, back into his orbit, you know. But so we can ask ourselves, how does how might Jesus use us to to bring to bring those people back? How can we show those people the love of Jesus that wants them to be here? But then I and I think the third way we really have to think about this, and we're going to get to this right here in just a second, is to realize that the same scheme that the devil has used to pull our society away from Jesus and to pull those individuals that we know away from Jesus is the same scheme that he's always trying to use even with us, right? And so, and that ties in with the other thing too. How can we be people who try to pull others back into the orbit of Jesus if we ourselves are drifting out of the orbit of Jesus, right? First, we got to be orbiting Jesus, right? And then we can start thinking about, well, how do we help bring those other people into the orbit of Jesus as well? Back to the sun, back to the light, back to the warmth, back to the truth, right? But we can only do that if we're nice and healthily orbiting around Jesus ourselves, right? So Satan's trying to do the same thing to us, which should cause us to think, you know, well, where is that in my life? And, and, and how do I work? How do, how do I struggle against that? Yeah. But we'll, we'll get to that more of that here in just a second. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay. There's some, 
Oh yeah, we got we got some 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 Bible verses to look at here. Um, Jesus warns us about the exact same thing. So Screw Tape has said that you know the, the the safe road to hell is this gradual easy one. Well, Jesus says that too, twice over actually. So Matthew chapter seven is the first one that we need. Verses thirteen to fourteen. So just a couple of verses there. Okay, so Jesus doesn't use the space analogy, unfortunately, because no one in his day would have understood what he's talking about. Jesus could tell them all about the orbits of the planets and everything like that, but the first century Jews would be looking at him like he's crazy because <laughs> they think the earth is flat and all such things like that. So instead of using the, the, the space analogy, Jesus uses the road analogy. You know, just like screw tape said, the, the, the safest road to hell is that gradual and easy one. Well, Jesus says the same thing too. He says, enter through the narrow gate. Okay, and, and this is the thing, the gate is narrow because the gate is Jesus. Okay, that's actually what the picture I have up here on the screen is trying to show you. Right, it looks like it's a P, like if you look at that gate, okay, it looks like it's a P and an X. It's not a P and an X, okay? These are Greek letters. The first one that looks like an X is, a, is a, called a chi, a CH, right? And the big one that looks like a P in the middle is actually called a rho, which is a Greek letter R. So it's CHR, the first three letters in English of Christ, right? Anytime you see a P and an X like that, it's called a chi rho, and it's a symbol for Jesus. We actually, when we get our Christmas tree up, we'll have, that's one of the symbols we have on the Christmas tree is this one, right? But this, this artist has drawn it here on this gate to show us, well, Jesus is the gate. That's why the gate is narrow. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. He's the gate, okay? So that's why the gate is narrow. The, the truth about the gate, though, is it's narrow, but wide open, right? There's only one way to the Father, but everyone who comes to Jesus goes to the Father, right? It's not like, the gate opens and shuts on some people or something like that, right? The, everyone who comes to Jesus comes to the Father. So the gate is narrow, but it's wide open. Contrary, co contrasting that gate, right? Jesus says, the wi wide is the gate that leads to destruction, right? The gate to the Father is narrow because it's only Jesus, okay? And we'll talk here in a second that we'll, and, the, and the way through that gate isn't necessarily the easy way, right? The way to the Father through Jesus. Jesus doesn't promise it's going to be easy. Remember, he also says, take up your cross and follow me, right? So the way to the Father through Jesus isn't easy, but it's there and it's wide open for you. Also wide open, Jesus says, is the way that leads to destruction. And he says, that way is easy. And there's many ways you can go, right? It's not narrow. Go whatever way. If, you, if that's where you want to end up, which nobody wants to end up in destruction, but if that's where you want to end up, Jesus says there's plenty of ways to get there. In fact, you can take any path you want, uh, and, uh, but, but narrow is the, is the gate and the road uh, that leads to eternal life. It's through Jesus. Okay? Now, we're, go we're going to look at this other one now because Jesus expands on what he's saying a little bit more in, Matthew cha or in Luke chapter 13. So if you haven't turned there already, let's turn to, to Luke chapter 13. Jesus uses the same picture again here. Luke chapter 13, we're going to read 22 down to 30. You don't need to read all of that if you don't want to, Elizabeth, just as, as far as you'd like. Our streets. 
But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. Okay, so this is all sparked by this question. Somebody asked Jesus, are a lot of people going to be saved or is it going to be a few? And Jesus doesn't answer that question, really. Okay, Instead, he goes back to the door thing. So we talked about the door is Jesus. It's narrow because he's the only way, but it's wide open because it's through his death and resurrection we go through him to the Father. Jesus does say, however, that a day will come when the door is closed. Okay, We heard that a couple of weeks ago when Jesus told the, the, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins or bridesmaids, right? The wise ones were ready. They went in with him through the door. The foolish ones weren't ready. They had to go buy oil for their lamps. And by the time they got back, the door was closed and they weren't allowed to come in, right? So there will come a day, which is the day when Jesus comes again, when then it will be too late for people to decide, okay, I believe in Jesus now, right? I trust you, Jesus, to be my salvation because I can see you with my own eyes. I believe it, right? And Jesus says, no, on that day, it'll be too late, right? Then the door will be closed. But look at what he says about these people who they're, they're locked on the outside. What does he say that they will say? What's their reason for thinking they ought to be able to come in through the door? Yeah. They, so look in, in verse 26, right? He says, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. So they, they, they say, Jesus, we were, we were close to you. We were in, we were in your proximity. We were around you and you were around us, right? So they say, Jesus, so you have to imagine this is, these are people who were living 2000 years ago, right? When Jesus was a human being walking around on the earth and Jesus was teaching in their town. And they say, Jesus, we were there that day when you taught in our town. But they didn't listen to his words. They didn't believe him but they thought they were good just because they happened to be close to Jesus that day, right? Or, 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 or they, they, they sat at a table and they ate with Jesus, right? But that time spent with Jesus didn't result in anything, right? We read a couple of weeks ago uh, from Luke chapter, well, I can't remember what chapter, no, 19, Luke chapter 19, where Jesus goes to the house of the man Zacchaeus, the tax collector who climbs the tree, Jesus goes to his house and Zacchaeus promises to give back whatever, was, whatever he took, all that kind of stuff. So there we see an example of someone eating and drinking with Jesus and it transforms this man's life. Because when Jesus comes, it is a confrontation that makes Zacchaeus realize that his life up to that point has not been up to the standards that God would have him live, right? But the fact that Jesus would come to his house is an expression of God's love and forgiveness. And so that realization of his own sin and that the, 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 the glorious news that Jesus loves him and forgives him anyways, it transforms his life, right? But these folks, they say, well, we ate and drank with you, Jesus. But it's clear they're, they, they haven't become Christians by that closeness with Jesus. They've just kind of been hanging around. Right? It's like they think they're good because they're orbiting around Jesus. But the truth is they're orbiting around Jesus way out around Pluto. Right? They're not actually that close to him. They don't trust in him for salvation. They just kind of were around him. Right? Thoughts or questions about that? Leah? Um, we're talking about literally eating and drinking and, and being with yeah. him, but I think it goes back to the beginning of the chapter when Screwtape says, I'm almost glad to hear that he is still a churchgoer and a communicant. Yeah. This person's still eating and drinking yeah, Jesus, yeah. but he's yeah. falling away, right? Yeah, you're a step ahead of me. Oh, this sorry. Is, <laughs> you think you think I planned this with her around or something like that. Anyways, so but yeah, that, that's why I put this here, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what this is what screw tape is saying. Right? We can make him into one of these people who is there when Jesus is teaching. He goes to church. 
and Jesus is teaching in his church, right? That's what's happening when we go to church, right? It's not pastor had a good sermon today. It's Jesus is coming to teach us, right? Or pastor had a lousy sermon today too. That can just as easily happen too, right? But Jesus is coming to teach us. So, so he's saying, screw tape is saying, we can make him one of these people who still goes to church and who thinks he's good because he was there in the place where Jesus was teaching or who goes to communion, right? And eats and drinks with Jesus and thinks he's good because he ate and drank with Jesus, right? But doesn't have the faith. Why is Jesus saying to himself, or oh, these people who are going to Yeah, yeah. He's not, yeah, he's not. Uh... So this is on the last day, right? Jesus has come again and he's told these people that don't believe in him, that don't trust in him for salvation, that they are outside of his kingdom. He's closed the door on them, okay? And they're knocking at the door saying, no, 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 we should be allowed to come in because, the, well, to put it into our terms, they're saying, gee, but Jesus, we came to church every Sunday. And Jesus is saying, okay, but do you actually trust in me for salvation? You came to church every Sunday, but do you have faith? And he's saying, no. Like when, by not letting them in, that's what he, when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. He's saying, no, fine, you came to church every Sunday, but you don't have faith. Right? And that's what screw tape says. They're trying to create the patient to be one of these guys who sure goes to church every Sunday, takes communion when they have communion, but doesn't have the faith to go along with it. Right? Who, th who thinks he's good because he's close to Jesus, hanging out at where Jesus is, but doesn't have the faith to go along with it. Right? Doesn't have the faith just to believe in Jesus that goes to church? Yeah. And go to communion? Yeah, that's what Jesus is saying. That can happen. Right? Jesus is saying that can happen. Right? It's hard to, I think it's. It's a facade, isn't it? I mean, what's that? It's a facade. Yeah, sometimes it can be a facade, right? I think it's harder to imagine now, but when you go back to when pretty much everybody went to church, a lot of people just went to church because that's what everybody does. Right? I don't think that was a thing, right? Elizabeth? Yeah. I had a church, not the same one as mine, but I had a few churches. We did the same thing. When we moved away, we didn't look for opportunities to go to any mm -hmm. service at all. And I think that, that drifting is what I got out of this chapter is yeah. that there were so many other things that your life was concerned with that it had been when you were in your own church community. Mm -hmm. Because your own church community, you enjoy and rejoice in seeing them on yeah. a Sunday. Yeah. And that kept you going. Also, your parents. Yeah. You, you went because you had a good connection and feeling besides what you had learned and the faith you had developed. Yeah. With yeah. lessons and things. And Jesus was, was there. Well, when you're further away and you're not going on a regular basis, it becomes, you know, you become like a, a you're not connected to Yeah, anything, yeah. And you drift away. Yeah. And unless you meet another Christian that invites you. Well, yeah, invites you or yeah. makes you feel comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you're a stranger. Okay? When Jesus uses that person to pull you back into the orbit, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah because, I mean, you know, I have a child that went to church for a lot of years and played organ. Yeah, yeah. That's drifted away. Yeah, sure. And, you know, you try to mm -hmm. make a connection when I'm there, and she goes with us because... Mm -hmm. She loves us. Yeah, yeah. And she goes. That's how people go to a service without yeah. really being there. Yeah. And I was like that for years. Yeah. I went home to Winnipeg, always went to church. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah definitely. It happens. it happens. It does happen. So, and, and, and there's some really neat Bible examples of this too, right? So, and one of them is, is, is I've got up on the screen here, Ezekiel chapter 33. And so Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel is written by Ezekiel the prophet, and Ezekiel the prophet um, lived at a time when the, the, the people of Israel, well, they were really just reduced to Jerusalem and the surrounding area, and they had gotten, it had gotten really bad, right? They're, they've basically been destroyed as a nation. Half of them have been carried away into slavery in Babylon, and... Uh, and prophets like Ezekiel and like Jeremiah had the job of, of calling God's people, calling God's people back. And so uh, Ezekiel, or God says to Ezekiel here, he says, as for you, son of man, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, say to one another, each to his brother, come and hear what the, wor what the word is that comes from the Lord. And they come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear what you say, but they will not do it. For with lustful talk in their mouths they act, their heart is set on their gain. So to summarize what's going on here, Ezekiel, or God is saying to Ezekiel, he says, Ezekiel, this is what's happening. Your people, the people that you're preaching to, they find out that you're going to be speaking and they say to each other, okay, come, let's go listen to Ezekiel and hear what God is saying to us through the prophet. Right. And so they come and he says, they come at, uh, they come to you as people come and they sit before you as my people, they come, they gather around Ezekiel ready to listen to God's word as he speaks it to them. And they hear what you say. They're sitting there listening to Ezekiel's words, but nothing ever comes of it. He says, but they will not do it. Ezekiel, assuming, I'm assuming here, is telling them that they need to repent and turn from the sin that they're doing, which is going to lead God to, to, to destroy their city. And they come and they listen to those words and they, it's like they nod along. They say amen at the end. But nothing ever happens, right? So, Satan's pulling the same trick here. He gets them to go to, quote unquote, go to church. He gets them to listen to the preacher, hear the words, and then just carry on as if nothing ever happened, right? Um, in contrast to that, Jesus says this in John chapter 15. This is how it should be, Jesus says. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in my words, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So Jesus, is now the, the, the image is of a vine and the branches, okay? And we are the, Jesus is the vine, we are the branches, and he says his word is this thing that, not just that we hear, that we, not just that we listen to, but what does he say that we do with his word here? Well, it causes us, it causes us to bear fruit, but it causes us to bear fruit when we abide in it, right? So Jesus doesn't say here, I'm the vine, you are the branches, if you hear my words, you will bear much fruit. He says, if you abide, it's a life, right? It's not just a, okay, I listened to Jesus today. It's a, Jesus's words live in me and I live in them, <laughs> right? They're my life. Jesus's words are like the sap that flows from the, the vine into the branch and causes the branch to be alive and bear fruit. Right, the the, the 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 sap that comes from the tree is the thing that keeps the branch alive. Right. So unlike with Ezekiel, the people are coming. They're saying, "Uh huh, we listen to your words, and then we go about our ordinary life." Jesus is saying, "No, no, 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 no. 
It's more like living in these things. It's this life that flows from me into you. Um, Martin Luther talked about this too in the large catechism. So we have the small catechism, which is the one we use for confirmation class and stuff like that. The large catechism is like the teacher's edition. Okay. And this is what he says about the third commandment. The third commandment is the one, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Martin Luther explains to us that it's not about not working on Saturdays or Sundays for that matter, right? It's not about resting, really. It's about listening to God's word and hearing it and believing it, okay? And so this is what he says. He says, therefore, not only those sin against this commandment who grossly misuse and desecrate the holy day as those who on account of their greed or frivolity neglect to hear God's word or lie in taverns or, 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 and are dead drunk like swine, but also that other crowd who listen to God's word as to any other trifle and only from custom come to the preaching and go away again at the end of the year uh, and go away again and at the end of the year know as little of it as at the beginning. So he says, so the people are breaking this commandment, not just when Martin Luther says, not just when they're like out at the tavern all night on a Saturday night and are so hung over Sunday morning that they can't drag their butts to church. He says, yes, those people are breaking the commandment. Okay. But he says, it's also those people who do, you know, and this is especially 500 years ago, everybody went to church. Okay. So he's, so Martin Luther saying, it's also those people who go to church and listen to God's word, just like they would listen to any other little trifle of a thing, right? Listen to God's word the same way they listen to whatever else they listen to in their life. Okay. Just another thing, right? And only from custom because it's their habit, go to church every Sunday. And then these folks, he says, they go away. And at the end of the year, they know as little about God's word as they did at the beginning, right? They never learn and grow in faith because they're not paying any serious attention to it, right? They're, they're, in, they're, they're hanging out around Jesus, but they don't actually know him, right? They're, they're living, they're, they're being where Jesus is, but they don't actually know him, right? So this, this is what Satan's trying to do to us. Right? To get us to be these people who don't take God's word into our hearts and believe it and have it transform our lives. But people who just come and say, well, I go to church on Sunday because that's what I do. And I listen to the pastor because that seems like the right thing to do. But, you know, none of this actually gets into our hearts to, to be something we believe, right? That transforms our lives as a result. Thoughts or questions about that? Mm -hmm. that's what christian life is right it's living in god's word and his word living in us yeah um but what i love about the book in the chapter where he's talking about this and he talks screw tape talks about how he's almost glad that the patient is still going to church he acknowledges though he says that there's a danger there there's a danger of the patient going to church for the, from their perspective, right? Because Jesus is actually there, right? The guy who can fire the buttons on the rock or ro fire the rockets on the spaceship and get him back into the right orbit, he's right there, right? Now, Screwtape says there's this possible, Screwtape's okay with him going to church and it says he's even glad about it because they think they can keep him close to Jesus without that happening. But the truth is, this is why I'm not, none of this is discouraging people from coming to church, not at all. The truth is, is that Jesus is there to do what Jesus does and to, do, to, to bring people to himself and that his word is there coming to us so that it can abide in our hearts, right? And so we can live in it. Thoughts, questions about that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the parable of the sower and, and where the, how the word grows. Yeah, yeah, it, it absolutely does too. Yeah, all the distractions that pull us away from God's word. Okay, well, one more thing here and then we'll, well, a couple more things. Then we'll wrap it up for today. 
the real, so, so on the one hand, screw tape and wormwood, they want to keep the patient as one of these people who goes to church, is close to Jesus, hanging out where Jesus is, but slowly orbiting away, right? That's what we've been talking about here. Pull him away from God's word so he's not living in it anymore or anything like that. The other benefit of that, screw tape says, is that it keeps him, uh, it will keep the patient from repenting of any definite, fully recognized sin. Right? If you go, if you pull him away slowly, he's never going to realize that he's wandered away. He's never going to be sorry for the fact that he wandered away because he doesn't even realize it happened. He's never going to turn back to God and confess his sins and God would forgive him. Right? Instead, if they keep him just slowly orbiting away, he says the, the patient will be left with a vague, though uneasy feeling that he hasn't been doing very well lately. Right? He'll realize, probably, that he's inching farther and farther away, but it won't seem that bad. So he'll have just kind of this uneasiness about him, which will stop him from really confessing his sins and being, and being sorry for what he's done, right? And what I want us to do to wrap things up here is look up in our Bibles again. And so this time we're Luke chapter 15, because I think this, this whole chapter is perfectly illustrated in the parable of the prodigal son. So we're going to, this is a well-known parable. We'll, we'll read through the whole thing. I think I'm just going to read it because uh, I'll want to stop when I want to stop and explain things, right? So I'm going to do that. So, but what we're, in the parable of the prodigal son, you have one son who takes a rocket ship to, to, to bring the, the, the space analogy back in here. You have one son who takes a direct line rocket ship straight out to Pluto and then comes back again. And you have another son who slowly orbits away. Okay. Remember, the, the father's got two sons. But so listen, listen to this here, and we'll talk about it again afterwards. So Jesus continued, this is verse 11, Luke 15, verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. In other words, I wish you were dead. Give me my inheritance right now. Okay? So he divided his property between them, which no father would ever do. This father's crazy. Okay? Crazy, loving his sons. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he, okay, so he squandered his wealth in wild living. He just took the rocket ship out to Pluto, right? He said, Dad, I wish you were dead. Remember, in this case, Dad is God, okay? the one that he should be orbiting around, getting his life from his father. He says to his father, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my share of the inheritance. He gives it to him, and he takes it and goes and spend, goes, moves as far away as he can and lives his own life, okay? And squanders what he's had on wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. So, this prodigal son has taken a rocket ship straight out away from the sun to Pluto, has lived out in, Pluto, uh, out, out in deep space for a while and realized it's a miserable place to live, right? His life is terrible. And so he decides to come back, right? And it's not, and th the reason I put this picture here on the screen is it's not just that he decides to come back. Um, so the, the, the picture is the prodigal son coming home, right? He's walking on his way home. There's all kinds of symbolism in this picture. But look at that. 
You can see the dove representing the Holy Spirit, right? It's the Holy Spirit who people can blast them out themselves out into deep space all they want. They never run away from the Holy Spirit, right? And it's the Holy Spirit out there in deep space who puts that reminder in his head that, well, actually, my father's house, there's plenty of food for everybody. And even if he lets me be a slave, at least I'll have something to eat, right? And sends him working his way back home, okay? So the prodigal son takes a rocket ship out to deep space, comes to his senses, turns around and comes home, and is going to offer to be a servant for his father, okay? Let's keep reading now. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He was planning to say, let me be one of your servants. The father doesn't even let him say that. Okay? But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Let the fat, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Okay. So the, the younger, the, the prodigal son, he's also the younger son we find out here in a second, takes a, you know, goes as far away from the father as he can. Holy Spirit brings him home again. And before he's even made it home, the father has already welcomed him back into the orbit. Right? And he's healthily orbiting around the father, and the father is overjoyed to have that. Right? Things are back how they should be, and he welcomes him home with joy. Okay? But now the other son. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. <coughs> when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. We'll read a little bit more here in a second, okay? But we've got this, so we've got the brother who takes the, the rocket ship out into wild living and then is brought back again by the Holy Spirit. But we've got this older brother who seems to have never left, right? He's been with the father the whole time, right? <laughs> Close to the father the whole time. But when we'll get a little more of this sense as we go, it's clear that he's been orbiting away slowly, incrementally, right? This older son, he, he's, he, well, when, when we look a little bit further here, he's going to say, father, you never even gave me a goat that I could have a little celebration with my friends or something like that. And the father says to him, but actually everything that belongs to me is yours, right? We, we share everything, right? How could it be that, 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 that anything that you need is lacking, right? But it's because he's orbited away, right? He's slowly but surely been been pulled away from Jesus or from the Father and from the Father's love, and he's still close there. He's still living on the Father's property, but he doesn't have any love for his Father, right? He's been he's been pulled incrementally away, slowly but surely pulled away. And so when when the older son comes home, or when the younger son comes home, this one's even unwilling to come in and celebrate with the rest of them. Right? Because he's slowly drifted away, is out in the field somewhere and, and won't even come in. But he didn't even know. Well, once he does know, right? Look at. He was out there working. He was out there working, which that, of course, was fine. Nobody invited him to come. But he built it and he near the house. He heard all the music and the laughing and the dancing. So nobody really. Well, look, no, look at, look at verse 28. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So what did the father do? Went out and pleaded with him, right? The father goes out, right? So, mm -hmm. Yes, yes, he's out doing his work. 
Festivity. Yes, and as soon as he becomes aware, he what, what's his reaction? He's angry. Yeah. Right? He's angry and he refuses to go in. The human reaction, yeah. Yes, but what we need to remember here is the Father is God. Yes, right? The Father is God. And this older son thinks he's been slighted somehow when he really hasn't at all, right? So we'll read on a little bit further here. He, so verse 29, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. He doesn't even consider himself a son. He says, father, I've been your slave for all these years, right? And this does not seem like the kind of father who this, that, that, do, that doesn't seem like an accurate description of what this father is actually like, who treats his children like slaves. He wouldn't even let the other one become a slave. But this guy's convinced himself that he's slaves for the father or something like that. I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who he won't even call his brother anymore, he says he's your son, not my brother, okay? When this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, nobody knows that. Yeah, he assumes. He's making gross assumptions here, okay? Comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. And the father says, my son, uh, well, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours, right? So th this older son is angry because he says, father, you've never even given me a goat. Which, so they killed the fattened calf for the younger son, right? Which is a big thing. A goat would be a relatively small thing. And he says, you've never even given me a goat. And the father said, why do I need to give you a goat? Everything I have is yours. If you, anything of my property that you want belongs to you. Right? But, Pastor. Uh-huh. Um, my kids always used to say that uh, I only had them so that they would do all of my work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that. It's kind of like that. Yeah. So yeah. They, they always said, you know, oh, I'm just a slave to you. You only had us so that we would do all the okay. housework and do all the gardening and yada, yada. And I said, fine, you don't have to do it. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So anyways, what I see happening here, okay, is you have the prodigal son, who takes the rocket ship out to space, does all kinds of awful things, and is brought to repentance. And you have the, the older son who never left, right? Who's lived very close to the father his whole life, has done what the father told him to do, or at least done his best, right? He thinks he's done it perfectly. But over time, has slowly really orbited away from his father. He doesn't love his father. He doesn't think his father loves him, right? He's, he, he hates his own brother, right? He doesn't think his father has given him anything good. He thinks of himself more as a slave than anything else, right? And he's slowly orbited away, right? He's, he, he's removed himself from the father, not, not like the other one did by disappearing to a far country and squandering his inheritance on wild living, but actually by being close and slowly pulled away, right? Satan is not trying to make a whole bunch of prodigal sons. I can't relate to that guy. I've never done what he did, right? I've never gone full run away from God and do exact opposite of what, he's, what he says I should do. I've never done that. But what Satan is trying to make is a whole bunch of older brothers, that's what Satan, that's what screw tape and worm would say they want to try and do to the patient. Make him one of these older brothers who's close to the father, close to Jesus, but not really having faith in him, not loving him, not trusting him, all those kind of things, but just close to him. They're trying to make him uh, into one of those people, slowly pull him out of the orbit, pull him away. Thoughts, questions about any of that? Yeah. 
angry and jealous, be angry. Well, you have loads of anger in your career, don't let it have this too. This guy can turn out to be debauchery, and you'll be put in place with him. Yeah. Yeah. If, but yes, you're right. It, so it, it's it's jealousy. But if, if the if the if this older son was in a good relationship with his father, he would be just as excited as his father is that his brother is home. Right. This should be a family celebrating together. The fact that this younger brother has come home. The problem isn't just that the young the older brother hates his younger brother. The older the older brother hates his father too. He's never left. He's never gone anywhere. But Satan has pulled him away from God, his father. So that when his father is rejoicing over the son, the younger son coming home, the older son can't even be moved to care at all. Right? And is only concerned about his own rights. Right? Or, his, or, or how he's been slighted in some perceived way or something like that. Right? Anyways, I... I, I I think that older brother is the most important character. Well, that, that's the character we need to recognize that we relate to him. Right? This, is, this is what Satan is trying to do to us, to make us like that guy. Right? He's not trying to make us all, like he's not going to, Satan's not working to make you go, you know, go far off into wild living. Right? Those days are past. Right? But he will work to make us like older brothers who live on the father's property, hang out where he is, and yet don't really have love for him, have faith in him, all that kind of stuff. So he, he tries to pull people away like that. The beautiful thing is just like the father welcomed home the younger son, if this older son came to his senses as well and came in to join the party, would this father welcome him into the celebration? Absolutely. Right? Because he, he loves this younger son so much that he himself runs out in the field to try and convince him to come in. Like, come on, you know, be part of our family here. Right? This is good news, you know, and the son argues. But if he were to come to his senses and come back to <coughs> that father is going to welcome him home just as much as he welcomed his younger son home. Any other thoughts or questions about any of that? I, Linda? One of the hardest things that you have to do as a parent is to make sure you don't do this to your children, that one's as important as the other. Yeah. And you have to show them their love. Yeah, well, and that's true. That's true too. But I, uh, what we need to realize is in the parable, because so in parenting, you're absolutely right. In the parable, I, I, w I wouldn't put the blame on the father. So when the younger son asks for his share of the inheritance, this, boy, this man's got two sons, the inheritance is gonna be split. Right? More than likely, he gave the inheritance to the older one too. Right? And, the old, and he says to the older one, everything that I have belongs to you. Right? So, but yeah, when it comes to parenting, this is absolutely right. These are all kinds of terrible examples in the Bible of parents loving one child more than the rest of them. Right? It, the, well, the case in point is Joseph. Right? And it go, you wonder why everything is such a mess. It's because Jacob loves Joseph more than the rest of them. Right? It obviously shouldn't be that way. But in this case, this is where it's important to remember the father in the story is God. God hasn't loved one of his children more than the rest. Right? We might fall, we can be like this older son and start to think that's how it's been. Right? But it's not actually true. Right? It's true with Jacob and Joseph. He loves one of his children more than he loves the other ones. But with God and us, his children, it's not that he loves one of us more than the other. The second we start thinking that, we're like this older son. We're wrong about that. God doesn't love some of his children more than other ones. Right? So the second we start thinking that, we're in the wrong. Right? Yeah? Elizabeth? What I thought of that is that we are all the older son. Yeah. Because we look at other people's sins and we think that their sins are worse. And I'm yeah. of uh, the father. One son's sins are no different than the other son's sins. Yeah. So we're the older, we're yeah. the older brother all yeah. the time because, you know, we have to be aware of it that we judge all the time. Yep. Yeah, and Satan is using that to pull us away from the Father, right? Absolutely. Yep. 
I think, I think this parable speaks to just how subtly Satan works, just as Screwtape has been mm -hmm. talking in our book. Because at face value, you look at this story and you go, yeah, the older son has a right to be upset because he's been shafted compared to his brother or whatever. And, and we feel like it's okay, like it's okay that he's feeling this way. We can justify why he's feeling this way. And it just goes to show how subtly Satan is, is working against what God the Father is actually doing or what the Father in this story yeah. has actually yep. done yeah. for his older son too. Yeah, yep, yep, absolutely. Any other thoughts or comments or questions? <laughs> homes and patients and our family members who come in and say, my mother always preferred my older sister and me and I don't care what the, and the anger and the fighting yeah. starts. Yeah, oh yeah. Because yeah. of conflict in a sense of she was more loved than me and she was more spoiled. I wouldn't be. And um, she had four daughters and one of them was adorable. One of them you would just love and instinctively she was just like a born saint. The other three had all different kinds of characters. And the mother said to me, I instinctively love the youngest one, not just because she's the youngest, but she has always been such a good child. So unconscious because she's a very loving mother, she kind of it, it was obvious somehow to the others that she really loved yeah. the youngest one. People are so jealous, they would tell me that I'm sorry, I'm going to the bed and their baby sister had done. So I just listened and I finally said, What do you want to be jealous about that? And yes, she loves you anyway. Yeah. And it was the conflict was on the reason. Yeah, yeah, but that's where we remember that the, the 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 father in the story isn't any regular old earthly parent who who has to struggle with those things, but God the Father, whose perfect love is equal for all of His children. Yeah, Linda, you were going to say something. Uh, this parable also feels like how the father set a celebration, and like in heaven, when one comes yeah. to yeah, so back to last week. Yep. Yeah, just like the woman with the lost coin, right? Celebrating what she's found. There's this joy in heaven over every sinner who comes, who is brought back home, right? Marilyn, you were going to say something? Yeah, I, I, at one point, I, I immediately thought of Cain and Abel. Yeah, oh yeah, there's a Cain and Abel thing going on here too. That's a, But that's a whole, if, we, if I unpack that right now, we'll be here for an hour. So Cain and Abel is a very important story in the Bible. And... Uh, in my family, and Devin always uh, kept saying, everybody, oh, yeah, he's the favorite. Oh, yes. <laughs> so every time, you know, and I always kept saying, oh, no, 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 no favorites here, you know. Yeah. So last Christmas, every card that I wrote, I put in, uh, my, to my favorite friend. <laughs> <laughs> and Zachary was the first one to open up, and he said, you did that in every card, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They figured so, it out. Figured you out. He's always, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's just a joke in our hearts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. We'll close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the privilege of being called your children. Uh, your love is, uh, is perfect and, uh, and complete for us. Uh, demonstrated in no place better than in your sending of in the sending of your son our lord and savior jesus christ uh, to be our savior to take our sins upon himself and die and rise again that we would have in him eternal life satan the evil one tempts us lord to to draw us away from you slowly and incrementally uh, trying to draw us away from your word so that it doesn't live in us and us live in it uh, we pray that you would keep us uh, in your word that you would Cause us to live and grow in it so that we would be faithful to your people and be ready to meet your son Jesus with joy uh, when he comes again and enter with him into the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which will have no end. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.